We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Howdy. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. I think it's always funny how when you do a podcast, you say hello, and then five minutes later when you press record, you kind of have to say hello again. Yeah, you have to be all formal. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Like we haven't been talking for the last five minutes. <laughs> exactly. Like we haven't already introduced yes. ourselves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's very weird. Yeah. Well, guys, um, you, you know Heidi very well, so there's no need for, um, for an introduction. We, we thought we'd get together um, to discuss the DSM, which, is, uh, it, which presents a, a, a wide range of diagnoses for different mental health disorders. And, um, you know, it's, just, it's, it's used very prevalently, I think. And um, there are pros with it when we're trying to be as diplomatic as possible. And I think one of those I probably should mention is it creates a, um, a language for therapists um, to understand each other. You know, when you're looking at um, different diagnoses, different disorders um, show patterns and those patterns can help us, you know, work our way back to the gingerbread house, so to speak, and help with a way for that client to move forward. Having said that, there are also some cons, and I don't think that's very uh, controversial to say. I think many people would talk openly about the fact that there always needs to be update, uh, there always need to be updates and things like that. But we thought it'd be a good um, podcast to to discuss the DSM and then see kind of how the conversation flows from there. But um, yeah, does that give us, what do, what do you think about that, Heidi? Like a relatively good yeah. introduction? Yeah. I think that's a good introduction. I think a lot of clinicians have a love-hate relationship with the DSM. Some have more of a love relationship with it. Some have more of a hate relationship, but I think it's a spectrum of love-hate with the DSM. So yeah, like a psychiatrist, I think. And for those that don't know, a psychiatrist is a, a mental health clinician who predominantly focuses on medication and diagnoses to treat. So, right. So they need to know what med what meds do I need to give a person, but to know that they first need to have a diagnosis for the person to then give the medication. So psychiatrists are all medication. And I think psychiatrists love the DSM because it informs a lot of their work, you know, but then on the other end of the spectrum, those of us that are therapists, then you kind of get into different territory of my personal opinion about <laughs> it, which is definitely more on the hate end of the spectrum. So, yeah. yeah. But yes, I think you did give a summary quite nicely. Yes. Sure, sure. No, well, look, I think, I think what we probably should do is just, uh, you know, in a professional, mature way, get out what we both feel needs to be discussed first. Um, and then we'll see if we can find some common ground with those who perhaps uh, like it more than, than you and I do. But how about we can go back and forth here. I think the first one that I would say is that it can box people in, you know, uh, as soon as you give someone a disorder, especially when they're, you know, and, and rightly so in such a volatile stage in their lives, you know, whether it's something's just acutely happened related to some kind of subconscious trauma or, some, something more circumstantial, you give someone an identity who's perhaps struggling with their own identity and it's not their fault, but they can latch onto that. And, um, and that begins to influence the way they live their lives in general, sometimes for decades, you know, and I think that is probably a, a, a really important point that needs to be discussed. I, I think in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. The, the thing that, stands out the most to me when I think of the DSM is dude, it was written in 1952, <laughs> like yeah. 1952 by yeah. probably a bunch of white dudes, a bunch <laughs> of old white men. Right. I don't want to be reading anything from yeah. 1952 that relates to my clients. that was written by a bunch of white dudes. Like it's so outdated, man. Mm. Like that's not progressive. It's not, mm it just, it frustrates me a lot because I just think it's antiquated 
but why I have the love hate is I think we do need it. I think we do have to have it. I remember at uni in my, um, in grad school, the writing a paper on what do you think about the medical model and do we need to have the medical model? And do we need to have the DSM? And I remember in researching for that and then writing it, I was like, damn it, we actually need this thing because you kind of do like, and the whole purpose of it was to have a common language mm. for psychiatrists and other mental health practitioners to be able to go, okay, so these symptoms equal depression. Mm. Oh, okay. We all agree on that. Okay, cool. These symptoms equal anxiety. Okay, cool. We'll agree on that. These symptoms equal bipolar. Okay. We'll agree on that. So like we had to have kind of a common, um, book, like a playbook hymnal, you know, to sing from. So we're all sort of on the, literally on the same page, mm. <laughs> but I guess what I, but what I guess frustrates me is that it was written in 1952 by a bunch of white dudes. So yeah. it's like a lot of the stuff in it is not relevant to 2022. And if you look at sort of the journey of some of the things that have been in the DSM and then taken out of the DSM or renamed, right. it's like, well, hang on a second. Then does that mean that it's not really the Bible, you know, of clinician of mental health like that five years from now, it's not going to have depression. It's going to have trauma response, you know, right. appropriate trauma response. So yeah, I think it, it's hard because it does serve a purpose for funding, for insurance, for schools. You know, if a kid has a diagnosis and a label on their forehead, it makes it a lot easier of what teacher to put them with or whatever. So we have to have some of these, you know, pathologizing ways. I just think, I don't, I just, I don't like it. Cause I think we're more than tick boxes. We're more than mm. lists. You and I, could probably qualify for lots of stuff, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> At various points in our life, right? Um, but like, dude, we're more than just tick boxes. And then also mm. when you zoom out and you go, well, what happened to you? What happened in your childhood? What happened in your 20s? It's like, well, no wonder you cry all the time. No wonder you don't want to go to work. No wonder you can't mm. get out of bed. Like it all makes sense. And to me, then that doesn't make it a disorder. That makes it a normal response. Ex yeah. But, you know, how do you, navigate that in a world that needs to have funding, insurance, labels, help at school, support, you know, it's like, it's kind of a necessary evil, I think. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with anything you said, you know, and, um, you know, maybe that's um, my fault for getting a good friend on the podcast who I agree with a lot, but at the same time, it's my fucking podcast. So I don't care. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> look, I think, you know, is it, it's, it's very prevalent in the, in the degree I'm doing at the moment. And um, at the very least identities and disorders can provide some reassurance, I suppose, in the short term, because people can say, Oh, hang on a second. Look, I'm not crazy. It's not just me against the world here. There is a thing that a lot of people go through. Um, and, and this is what other people are doing um, to, to, to work through, manage their, their issues, whatever it is. Community above all else is, an, is, a, is an, a really significant marker of um, psychological health. And I think that can be a really important um, benefit associated with the DSM. But to your point, I mean, who would drive a car from the 50s, <laughs> you know? That, I mean, no one would jump into a car if someone said, oh, yeah, it's still still going, still ticking along 70 years later. You know, you mentioned, you know, a whole bunch of white dudes as well. Like the, the lack of cross-cultural awareness as well, massive, you know. And I think um, when you have, because there, there might, be, might be some more conservative voices perhaps saying, look, but it is being updated, you know, it's constantly being discussed and everything. And I understand that, but when the actual what's being updated is predicated on something that was born in an era that is so much more unaware than we are right now and much less connected. It is, it is, you do start to question whether or not the thing can be moved along and disregarded because we have transcended a lot of those ideas now, you know? Totally. And I think, um, you know, things like homosexuality was in the DSM yeah. until 1974. Like what? And then <laughs> they changed another thing to, um, in 2013, distressed by homosexuality. And it's like, again, they put thought they're pathologizing something that's super normal and fine, but it's being labeled as like weird, 
or mm. bad or not okay. And it's just, it's so cringe, man. It's mm. so cringy. And then I think too, where I'm seeing a lot of discussion around this is um, gender identity mm. and how gender identity has changed a lot, like mm. from the fifties yeah. to now and what's okay. And sexual identity, gender identity. I mean, it was called, I don't know if it is still called gender dysphoria, mm. um, but again, dysphoria that it's like not okay. It's mm. weird. It's, it's outside the norm, but just the labeling of stuff that I just, I mean, and dude, it's called the um, diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Like mm. it's, it's a book of dis orders messed up stuff you know That's is what it. that says and that just says it just pisses me off because it's like if your whole family is you know killed in a train accident and you don't want to get out of bed kind of think that's normal. I don't think that's a disorder. I think that makes a lot of sense that mm. you're struggling to work. Right. It, so to me a lot of the things that are in there are pathologized and labeled as bad or not okay or or just bad, wrong not, not okay. Not mm. good enough. And to me, it's always, well, that completely makes sense. That's a totally normal response. Like you were locked in a closet, you know, for an hour a week in your whole childhood makes sense why you're a bit claustrophobic. Like, right. I don't think that there's a disorder there. It's just a normal trauma response, you know? And I think that's what, because I'm a trauma specialist, I think that's where I get really cranky is because Obviously, as a trauma specialist, I see everything through a trauma lens, right? Like cool. I meet a client mm. and in 10 minutes, I'm like, mm, trauma. Yeah. You know, or like after an hour, I'm like, what's the trauma there? Yeah. You know, or a Joy colleague, a colleague, yeah, a colleague will say, Oh, can you, you know, help me with this client I'm, I'm stuck with? And then I'm just going, Yeah, what's the trauma? What's the trauma? I'm always yeah. like, trauma is always what I see mm. everything through, right? So I I I wear I will wear that, that I'm biased in that, but to me, every time I hear someone tell me their story or I read something or watching a movie or a TV show or whatever, I'm just like trauma, 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 yeah. trauma, trauma, trauma. I just see it everywhere. And so then it's like whatever their behavior looks like, I'm like, well, that makes total sense. Mm. Of course, you're going to act like that. Of course, you're going to be that way. Of course, you're going to be rude. Of course, you're going to be angry. Of course, you're going to have a hard time. Um, connecting to your emotions or whatever because of blah, 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 blah that happened when you were growing up. Like to me, mm. it's not a disorder. Like nothing, I, I really don't, I, I believe everything is a trauma response, honestly. So Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you know, I, I, I consider you a, a real mentor of mine and um, a lot of the stuff and the ways that you, you, you kind of see therapy and stuff has really helped me with, with my clients as well. And, um, you know, when we're talking about, being trauma informed. It's just that, look, if, if you're a therapist, you know, that um, if, if you've done any study at all, the first thing they say in virtually every single course, as far as I can tell, is build rapport. And, and building rapport is about trust and connection and, and helping someone feel safe to go into, you know, difficult experiences and memories, you know, and, and how, how else to do that then look at someone through a trauma lens and go, I understand why you are the way you are. You know, I think in our, in our, in our last podcast, you and I were laughing because we were like, oh yeah, Trump was just that kid that never got hugged. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we were talking Definitely. about like 10 minutes, you know, yeah. but like when yeah. you start seeing people, you know, well, in the very beginning, you start seeing yourself through that lens and going, I understand why I'm the way I am right now. Not because I'm disordered or anything, but because this is how my psyche and my physiology physiology had to adapt to an environment that was unique to me and then you look out in the world and you go oh mom dad friends family oh this is cool now you know and we can connect in that in that in that that really lovely way to then label how we've had to evolve necessarily as a disorder you know especially when it comes to dealing with people who've had significant trauma dumps a whole lot of shame, which to me is just a, a massive roadblock. You know, it's just, we're, we're getting nowhere when we have to move through the shame as well, you know? Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I think about the number of times that people will tell me a story and then I'll say something like, so do you consider that like a childhood, you know, this was my experience from zero to five or from ages five to 10. And I might be sitting there with my brain going like, whoa, that's gnarly. And then I'll say, did you feel traumatized by any of that? Or does any of that resonate? Does the word trauma fit? Or does that feel like it doesn't fit? 
And a lot of times people will be like, well, oh, no, trauma doesn't fit because I wasn't in a car accident. I wasn't in a fire. Um, I didn't watch my family be murdered. You know, I was never assaulted. So like mm. what I went through that I wouldn't really classify that as trauma. And I'm like, <gasps> Okay, can I just give you my favorite definition of trauma? And then yeah. I always say, you know, because I've said it to you before, my favorite definition of trauma comes from Peter Levine, which is um, any experience where we feel profoundly helpless or lose our ability to cope. And mm -hmm. then when I say that, people go, oh, okay, well, if that's the definition of trauma, have I had times in my life where I felt helpless? Sure. When I had my cancer diagnosis, when my mom died when I had to move schools twice in second and third grade and I didn't want to, and I was the new kid. Um, when I had my tonsils out, when I had a teeth removed, you uh, know, a yeah, teeth exactly. extract, a tooth extraction when I was eight, like all these little things that were, you know, not considered legit trauma. But then they're like, yeah, when you say, did I feel really helpless? Yeah. Did I kind of have moments where I lost my ability to cope? Yeah. Oh, that's trauma. And I'm like, yeah. And the crap about big T trauma and little T trauma, I don't like because it's not like it's all relative, right? right? Like to me, white girl, white privilege, the, you know, the shit that I grew up with, that's completely different to some kid in Afghanistan or kids in the Ukraine right now or kids in Russia, mm -hmm. right? Like totally different. Like, and it's not the pain Olympics. I'm not going for a gold here, but it's like everyone's situation is relative to them and it's all perception. So um, like if I have a, like I had a client once who the worst thing that ever happened to her was a bad spray tan. And I'm, I'm yeah. totally serious, but it's all relative, right? right? If she grew up in her little safe bubble and that's the worst thing that's ever happened to her, then I hold in my mind that to her, that felt like assault or that felt yeah. like being in a car accident, right? That, so the, the, the gist of this or where I'm going with all of this is I think all of us have trauma. It just is in varying shades of gray and it's not black and white. And how your brain and your body will try to make sense of it or work through it or rebalance you and try to find safety, which is ultimately what the brain is just obsessed with. You did stuff in your personality, in your behavior to adapt, to cope, to ultimately find safety. And so if you were beat, if your parents minimized feelings, if you never got hugged, if you never were allowed to cry, whatever it is you adapted at a really little age, really, really smartly to survive. Mm. So if I knew that my parents couldn't tolerate my emotions, say, or they never asked me about my feelings, I learned to push them down and disconnect from them because they didn't serve me. If whenever I had big feelings come up, it, it distanced my caregivers, it pushed them away. So I just learned, oh, shut it down, put it to the side. It doesn't make me fit in at school. So it's, they're just not safe. Mm. So then when you're 40 and you're coming to see me for therapy and you're like, I can't access my emotions. I don't know why. I'm like, I know why, because yeah, that's it. <laughs> something happened from zero to 10 where your parents or your friends or school or whatever emotions were bad. Right. So then in the lens of looking then through all of the stuff I just said, looking at the DSM, it's like, you can't just look at, flip to a page, see a, you know, checklist of symptoms and things, and then go, oh yeah, this person has bipolar, this person has, um, generalized anxiety disorder or whatever because they tick all these boxes. It's like, you got to zoom out and you got to look at the whole picture of what mm. happened. And then, cause then to me, it doesn't, it's not a diagnosis. It's not a, there's something wrong with you. It's what happened to you is the better question, you know? Mm. Well, I, the point you made before about, um, you know, trauma being relative, I, <laughs> I agree once again. <laughs> People that don't like echo chambers can have a field day here. <laughs> um, the whole big T, little T thing is total bullshit in my opinion as well because the worst thing that has ever happened to you is the worst thing that's ever happened to you, you know? Exactly. And you're, you're exactly right. It doesn't matter if, as well, you know, if it's a spray tan or, you know, a return soldier, your, you, your unique setup doesn't have anything else to go off. So understanding how that made you feel is, is a really important thing. And I think look, bringing it back to the, the DSM, recognizing how, how we had to cope, you know, how we learned to cope, I suppose, with our pain points, things like ADHD make so much more sense. You know, I was speaking to a guy last year who was looking after a young fella with 
ADHD. And of course, you start to ask about the environment. In what environment would someone need to adapt to being aware all the time and being unable to focus on one particular thing? And then very quickly said, well, he's, you know, his, his biological mother was um, a drug addict and, you know, that the house was, there was a lot of domestic violence in the house. And it's like, oh, and then when you read um, people like Gabal Mate and Johan Hari, they, they take it a step further and they say, so giving a kid Ritalin who's struggling in an environment with ADH, with, with domestic violence is almost like saying, hey, you better buckle up and wear this shit, you know? which is a very damaging perspective to take, but that's kind of what it's doing, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, ADHD, don't get me started. That could be a whole nother podcast <laughs> episode. <could. laughs> but the number of times that parents will say to me, because you know how I do a lot of work with parents, parents will say to me, um, we think he has ADHD or he's been assessed for ADHD or mm. you know diagnosed with ADHD. And I'm always just like, what happened yes. because it's just there's a there's a story behind it it's just not you pop out that way i definitely mm. think there's like temperament stuff that yep. for sure that you come out and like if we just left you in the nursery at the hospital and you never had the nature nurture thing and you know it was just you were left without your parents involvement that there are definitely traits that would emerge you know extroversion introversion there's lots of stuff that I definitely believe are hardwired mm. and focus and attention definitely is there are some people that are more focused and some people that are more, you know, looking around. Right. But what I definitely agree with you on is ADHD is often a really smart response to be not focused on one thing to be focused on 700 things because I may have grown up in a stressful environment. I may have grown up in an environment where mom or dad were highly anxious or mom or dad had an underlying feeling of stress about them that when I was one, I couldn't articulate that, but I sensed mom is really anxious. Like maybe she has postnatal anxiety mm. and she's constantly worried about me choking or bumping, you know, my forehead or whatever, or my nap schedule. I'm, I'm not sticking to the nap schedule. And so mom is constantly <gasps> anxious and a one-year-old a baby can't articulate and understand what that is, but they can feel it. They can sense it. And so if, if the whole environment that the child is sort of absorbing is stress or chaos or fighting or tension or fear. Mm. It makes total sense why their nervous system would adapt again, right? If all of the sort of information that's coming towards me is danger, 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 it makes sense that then every cell in my body and every nerve ending is going to start going, <gasps> where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Look, 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 you know, pay attention and be mm. boo, 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 all over the place because Again, brain's obsessed with survival, brain's obsessed with safety. So that's a smarter way to be if you're in a stressful environment. But see, again, when we go back to that stressful environment, people will be like, well, I didn't grow up in a stressful environment. You know, my dad wasn't beating my mom. We had food on the table. And then I might, you know, dig a little bit more and, and ask, you know, what was your mom's energy like? Was she calm and relaxed? Oh, no, 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 no. She was a worrier or she constantly cared what other people were thinking, or the house always had to be immaculate. She was always really busy. And then it's like, well, this makes sense again. Why? But again, I go back to like, I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think ADHD is a bad thing. I think it's hard. Sure. I think it, it's a harder, you know, being neurodiverse is definitely a harder way to roll in life. It's harder to live that way because the world wasn't built for the neurodiverse. It was right. built for the neurotypical, right? Yeah. Anyway. So I think it's just, but then, you know, just on that ADHD thing, I have had adult clients that have said to me, you know, do you know of someone where I can do it? You get assessed. Um, Cause I don't do ADHD assessments, but um, they'll say like, do you know someone where I can get assessed? And I'm like, yeah, what would that give you? What would the diagnosis mean to you? And we kind of explore that. But I've had a lot of adults that have said getting an ASD um, autism spectrum disorder an ASD or an ADHD diagnosis has meant so much to them because mm. it's validated thank you. I'm not just lazy. I'm not disorganized. I'm not, you know, rude. I actually have this 
way that my brain is wired that makes it hard for me to read emotions or it makes it hard for me to stay focused and organized. And it's been really comforting. So again, this is where I go back to the, I love the DSM because it helps people feel seen and heard in some senses, you know, Mm. in some ways. But I think also being recognizing how your own childhood played a role in the functioning of your brain is also very validating and also moves you beyond. Cause I, one thing I always try to say to, to, you know, guys and girls that I'm working with is, um, okay. So you've got ADHD. Okay. Um, is this good or bad for the life that you want to live? You know, it's like, well, I'm an entrepreneur. Great question. Well, well, that's Great like, question. Great like, question. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, uh, cause it, it all, I think everything depends on the, the vision you're creating for yourself and who you want to become. And if you're an entrepreneur, you know, and you want to build all these businesses and use that ADHD, I wish I had that kind of brain because you got to be across 17 different things at once and spot fires and everything like that, you know, but the main thing, I mean, a disorder is relative to the lifestyle that you want to live, not the lifestyle that you are living. And, um, and I think, um, there needs to be some more awareness around that because I think we, we just hear the word disorder and we go, Oh, something wrong, you know, but it is and it isn't depending on who you are, you know, what you do. Totally. I think of like Gary Vaynerchuk, who is totally undiagnosed ADHD yeah. <laughs> and it works awesomely it for him. Like it. it's so great for, I mean, he's, I've seen him say jokingly before, like, if I had been diagnosed as a kid, I for sure would have been given ADD or ADHD because he's yes. all over the place, but like he's doing all right. Like it works for him, you know, mm-hmm. like it's, it's fine. But I think, yeah, you're right. You got to look at your childhood for sure. Um, that's a, that's actually like a really standard um, question for me whenever I start working with the family. So parents come to me and go, Oh, Heidi, my kid has rage issues or Heidi, my kid has anxiety can you help us fix my kid? You know, and Mm. they're often quite surprised when I say, can you tell me what the pregnancy was like? They're like, what does that have to do with anything? (laughs) What was the birth like? Again, what does that have to do with it? What was the first three months? Like what was the first year? Like, and parents are often, sometimes I I see their faces a bit like, how is this relevant? Why are we wasting time on this crap? And I'm like, because this is everything because pregnancy is when the nervous system that this being is going to carry for the rest of their life mm. is being built. Like we're talking about the foundation of a freaking house, man, that you're mm. going to be living in until you're a hundred. Then the wiring, the plumbing, all this stuff is being built whilst cooking in a mother who is stressed, mm. calm, anxious, peaceful, doing yoga, running away from an abusive partner. Like, what kind of environment is this child being cooked in? And if the child is being cooked in a cortisol and adrenaline filled bubble, well, pretty good chance that they're going to come out with a nervous system that finds it really hard to regulate. Mm. And then tell me about the birth. What was the birth like? Oh, he almost died. The cord was wrapped around his neck. You know, it was a really traumatic birth. And then again, I'm like, well, this makes a lot of sense. You know, if you watch, I don't know if you've ever watched any of Peter Levine's work, like when he actually is working with people. Oh my Lord. It is magic is not even the right word, but like just watching him work is just stunning. And Mm. I watched him do once a, um, a session with a, how old was he? Maybe 18 month old baby who had a really traumatic Mm. birth. And so for those of you that don't know, Peter Levine is a guru in trauma land. And he does a lot of somatic work, which means he does a lot of body stuff. And so when, um, trauma is trapped in the body, it produces different behaviors and responses and stuff. And so this little baby had a really traumatic birth and, um, the work that he does with the mom and with the baby and how he narrates what's happening, um, and how like the baby wouldn't ever want to be held. Um, and anyway, and he ends up just doing some gentle, um, techniques with him and the mom. And then at the end, and you like, you watch it, it happens in front of your eyes that the baby then sort of wraps into the mom. And she's like, he's never allowed me to hold him like this before. And he's, he's never felt comfortable in my arms. He's always been a bit, doesn't want to be held. And then you think about stuff like that, right. And how that could have impacted the trajectory of this kid's life and his attachment with her and all that sort of thing. Right. 
but what did Peter do? He focused on the birth and that, yes, it was only a baby. And how can he remember? He doesn't even remember it, but the body mm-hmm. remembers. Mm-hmm. And so he did all of this work to help process that. But anyway, mm-hmm. when you are looking at why someone is the way that they are now, if we were to open up the DSM and pick something, so often I find, especially with children, kids who have a really hard time regulating, adults who have a really hard time regulating, when I go back to those three questions, what was pregnancy like, what was birth like, and what was the first year of life like? Mm. People who have a really hard time regulating their emotions almost always have the trifecta of the pregnancy was stressful, the birth was stressful, and the first year of life was stressful. Mm. And I, I'm like, well, no wonder it's so hard for your nervous system to relax because when it was built, it was in stress town, man. It was. Mm-hmm being pummeled with cortisol and adrenaline and the fight flight response was just sort of constantly going off for the formative part of your existence. Mm, mm. Yeah. You know? It's a, do you ever get resistance to that? Like, you know, when you're trying to make a connection with someone and, and you'll say, look, okay, we'll, we'll put the word trauma aside from for here for the moment. But did you, did you ever feel like your environment was unsafe or helpless or whatever? Mm. People who are just, they're not incapable, of course, because it's not their area and that's totally fine, but they're so attached to this identity of it, you know, not being trauma. How do you kind of work through that? Well, I think that comes from a place of, I don't want to admit that I'm a victim. Mm. I think that the victim conversation is tough. It's double-edged sword because there's a group of people that don't want to be a victim and are like running as far away from that as possible. And so if I have a diagnosis or my kid has a diagnosis or I've experienced trauma, that means I'm a victim in some way and gross. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where people are like bathing in their victim jacket and love it, you know, like (laughs) give me all the diagnoses. I want all the acronyms and my kid to have all the acronyms because, you know, alphabet soup is yummy. So different kind of people, but I guess I think it comes, it comes down to a, a thing of, I think shame that maybe people feel shame and not wanting to admit that, especially moms. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's like the quickest way I could get a mom to cry. If I like had that agenda that I wanted to make someone cry, it would be when I, when I have this conversation with a lot of parents in that first session, when I say like, can you tell me a bit about pregnancy, birth and um, the first year of life? And it's all, like, dude, it's almost always the same thing that mm-hmm. it's like stressful, 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 anxious, anxious, anxious. You know, like my dad died. Um, my husband was out of a job. Uh, my toddler was sick and in hospital with cancer treatment. Like, and it's just like, mm. oh my gosh. Well, of course, like anyway, um, I think there's a lot of tears and I bet you there'll be people that are listening to this. So will be crying because there's a lot of tears, I think in the <sighs> two ways. One. Oh, this makes sense. There's an exhale. There's kind of like a, oh my gosh, that's why I've always had drug and alcohol issues. I just find it so hard to regulate. I just find it so hard to be alone with my feelings or stress. I just find it so hard to not numb and avoid. Um, so there's a relief, I think, that comes. And then mm. there's some parents will say to me, they find it really relieving to hear this because they're like, oh, it's not shit parenting. It's not that I did something wrong. It's that you know, we were dealing with our older kids battling leukemia, Mm. um, diagnosis to treatment was all during pregnancy birth. And okay, this makes sense. This makes sense. It's just harder for her to regulate. That's why she can't calm down. That's why she's so ragey because her nervous system is just always at this high level. It's hard for her to (sighs) drop. Right. And then usually I had a dude last week, a dad, um, where we were talking about his kids, um, birth and ah horrific 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 and he's just crying in this first session as i'm like explaining to him she's not trying like she's eight i'm like dude she's not trying to be a pain in the ass she's not trying to be difficult and Mm. ragey for shits and giggles like she's like that because her nervous system was built in like all the workers who were working on building the foundation of the house were stressed Mm. And sleep deprived. And so the the foundation that was built into her, 
It's not her fault. Who would pick that? Who would want it? Who would choose to be dysregulated all the time and to not be able to calm themselves down? Nobody would pick that. Mm. And that's, I think, one of the gifts with adults when I have this conversation is them realizing, I think most of the time, I think people take it well because it makes them feel validated and it makes, it makes themselves make sense. And I think that's always a nice feeling when you make yourself make sense. It's like, Mm. that's why I do that. Oh, okay. I know like in my own therapy, when my therapist and I work something out of like, where does that come from? And I'm like, that's seven-year-old me or that's my mom's voice, that, that critical voice or whatever. That's something she would have said, you know, when you work it out, it's like it, I don't know. It just, it feels comforting because you Mm. make sense of something. It doesn't feel so kind of weird or obscure, but I think with, um, with when I say that to people, yeah, there are sometimes that people would be offended or like, no, 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 it's not trauma, but where I can kind of always get them to agree is by saying, did you feel profoundly helpless when your dad lost his job and you had to move? Well, yeah, I found it really, I was really frustrated because I had to say goodbye to all my friends. And I'm like, okay, so dude, maybe that's your trauma. That's your biggest wound. That's the hardest thing that you've ever been, been through. And again, like you said, we're not comparing it to the kid who's growing up in a war torn country for you. That is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And there's no shame in that because people say to me all the time, Oh, I don't need therapy. And I'm like, (laughs) Bullshit! You don't yeah. hear me. You're no worries, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like you're human. Yeah. And if you are human, you are having a human experience, which means you have human emotions and trauma at some point in your life. And I don't say trauma to be like, let's everyone talk about our trauma. And we all have trauma. I don't mean it in that victimy way. I just mean like oh. you need to recognize it and admit to yourself that this is what it is, which is, Mm. this was an experience where I found it to be profoundly, I was profoundly helpless and it was really hard. And that like, so sometimes I think it's almost, you got to get people to realize and admit and, and honor in themselves. I was a victim actually. That wasn't okay. How my dad treated me. That wasn't okay. How my mom spoke to me. That wasn't okay. How the kids treated me at school camp that one time or whatever. Mm. Like you have to first kind of get to that I was hurt. That wasn't okay. And then you can go to the, what's the learning? What's the meaning? What's the lesson and all that kind of cute stuff. That's like nice. But like, I don't think you start there. I think you first, and I've done this with clients where I've said, would it be okay to acknowledge that I was a victim in that experience and that it, that was not okay. Mm. And sometimes people will be like, no, that's not okay. And then we explore that. Why? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with saying that was hard? What's wrong with saying that hurt me, you know, well, it makes me feel vulnerable. It makes me feel mm. weak. I don't want to say that, you know, yeah. especially dudes, you know, <laughs> totally. Anyway. Totally. Yeah. Well, that's, um, you know, that's a really good point. I th- and again, I think it, it depends on the client, doesn't it? You'll find someone who's in, who loves being in victim land. And then it's like, mm. well, it's more about moving into taking responsibility for how, who you want to become and owning it. And that's the work there, or it's, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Responsibility workaholic. And it's like, Hey, we need to just chill out and recognize. And I think the fastest way to, I mean, all these words have baggage. Trauma has baggage. Victim has baggage. And really, if you get rid of all that stuff, all we're trying to do here is help you live the life that you want to live. You know, we we can come up with any word. If you don't like the word trauma, what about the word flaw? (laughs) or book or lipstick, we we need to have some way of describing an event that made you feel helpless to use your words. And as soon as we can acknowledge that we can move on. But I think what you said before about um, when you do, you know, I think you can tell the difference. I've I've had this with my own therapy. You've had it with yours. We've had it with people that we've, we've worked with. You can tell the difference when someone's really acknowledged their pain because you see them lifting the bag of rocks off. You know, I remember just last year, it was a thing that I was very subconscious, you know, to unaware of. And when my therapist said, you know, is this, do you ever feel like this is actually quite obsessive? And I was like, oh, she got me. And then it goes, and then bang, I'm out. There's the tears, 20 minutes. (laughs) But you feel lighter, you feel lighter. And I think, um, you know, that's, I think that is actually from an evolutionary perspective in some way, what they think tears and depression and all that are for it's hey i'm helpless then the community bands together and we lift each other up you know um so yeah 
There's another point I think with the DSM, Heidi, that might be worth chatting quickly about um, is mm. despite the fact that a lot of these disorders are behavioural adaptations, there are also some with strong genetic proclivities. We okay. take the example of, say, um, schizophrenia, you know, and, mm. um, and, and what that can kind of do. And, um, and, and you mentioned before about hard wiring. But I think, you know, being in trauma and trauma informed and, and, and understanding how, as you said, the mind, the brain is set up for survival. Why would that be any different? You know, it's not, it's not like we can just get these disorders. And if we're going to take the Darwinian model with everything else, basically in our entire society, well, then why would that be separate to, oh, these disorders can just, you can just get them and then you need drugs for the rest of your life. You know, and I think even to um, go out on a limb here, something like schizophrenia, I wonder if, you know, from an ancestral perspective, someone who was crazy high in openness from a personality profile might have been really useful from looking at different ways to adapt to their environment and thinking about new things and being, you know, um, curious in, in that kind of way. But yeah, I was just wondering um, your opinion on kind of that, that genetic hardwiring hmm. idea. Yeah, I definitely think that all of us are predisposed to a lot of things in our genetics, right? It's just whether or not they get sort of turned on or turned off. And um, Joe Dispenza is great at this stuff. If anyone is keen to learn more about this, anything by Joe Dispenza is great. My favorite book of his is um, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Have you read that? Yeah, I've read yeah. that actually. It's good. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, but yeah, the, the thing is that, yeah, there's, you could be predisposed for alcoholism, um, say, but it just depends if you turn that off or on by the life experiences that you have. And then the kind of parents you have, what your childhood's like, what's your school like, you know, lots of different things of like, what's your experience of life been like? And so whenever parents say to me, my kid was diagnosed with whatever, um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, or is it genetic? Are their kids going to have it too? And I'm like, dude, it's a perfect storm. It's so many things need to line up just so to get a kid to have blank, whatever, mm. pick, pick anything in the DSM. So we're doing a combination here of pregnancy, birth, first year of life need to look ah, a certain way. Mom and dad's relationship needs to be ah, a certain way. Mom and dad's temperament and the way that they communicate, regulate themselves, blah, 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 needs to be a certain way. Schooling friendship, a skiing accident or a running accident or being hit by a car, like any kind of stuff that happens. There's so siblings, birth order, um, mm. race, um, gender identity, sexual identity. There's so many factors at play. This is why whenever people go, you know, there's four kids in that family. And it is so weird how there is one of those kids that just seems like such a black sheep or like yeah. how did they even come out of that family. They were, our kids will say to me, we were all parented the same way. And I'm like, no, you were not. No <laughs> kid is parented exactly the same way. You think that because it's the same parents in the same house, but no kid is parented the same way because everyone is different and there's different temperaments and birth order and gender and expectations and all that. So I believe with that kind of discussion around, are you born with it? You know, or was it always there? I think you have to have a lot of perfect moments where everything mm. aligns in a perfect way that it turns all of these different genes on. And then what dial is it at? Is it out of 10? Is it out of five? You know, I think there's lots of different things that happen. It's like borderline personality disorder is another one that um, I think is a hot, hot one. I think mm. borderline and disassociative identity disorder, DID, which previously in, um, the DSM was multiple personality disorder mm -hmm. until I think 94, they changed it to DID. So um, DID and borderline, I don't know if you've had this, but I think if I had another 15 year old or 20 year old tell me, I think I have DID or um, borderline, I'm like, okay. <laughs> like I had a psychiatrist tell me once, um, a psychiatrist tell me, you know, DSM loving psychiatrist yeah. say, I said, we were conversing about a client that we shared a 16 year old girl. And I was like, um, you know, another psych said that they think that she has borderline. What do you think? And he goes, Oh God, <laughs> if I hear another teenage girl thinking that she has borderline, he's like, they all have borderline. 
teenagers are all borderline. Yeah. Like it's just <laughs> how it is being a teenager. It's just all this stuff, you know, fear of abandonment, da, da, da. self-harm. Mm. He's like, it's just, that's teenagers, man. To pathologize and label them with something like borderline personality disorder when their personality is still developing and emerging. He's like, it's just ridiculous anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that could be there that's maybe turned off or on depending on your, you know, experiences and your family and where you grow up. And, you know, there's just, there's a lot of things I think that play into it, but mm -hmm. yeah, something like that with, um, there's lots of diagnoses I think out there that all of us, I think you take any woman after she's had a baby and there's a pretty good chance there's going to be depression and anxiety going on sure. hormones, sure. all sorts of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like there's just a lot of things that are just normal responses. They don't need to be pathologized, you know, no. anyway. Don't need to be labeled. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's about um, recognizing that we're all a bit, we're all a bit weird, but that weirdness yeah. <laughs> is actually yeah. really healthy because if you stand back enough, you go, okay, I'm in a body. I've no idea how I got in here. We're also going to die. And what the hell does that mean? How the hell do I just get the energy to take the bins out? Like who cares when I'm going to die? And I don't know what that means. Like you stand back far enough. None of it makes any sense. So totally. I understand where that need for certainty and disorders and labels, you know, it can come from. And I, we also, you know, Hey, we've given the devil his due. We, We've given it a crack on the show, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I kind of, I kind of knew we were going to come here at the end, but um, it is. But I think it's, I think it's helpful though, for people to hear us talk about it that are maybe not sure if I want to get a diagnosis or I want to get my kid assessed or, um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm curious about it. What does it actually mean? Is it mm. helpful? I think it's good to hear this kind of different perspective because um, I think we're giving people permission to live in the gray and you don't have to be black and white, you know, like that you yeah. can, you can get a diagnosis and go, cool, I'm going to file that one away in my head or for my kid. Doesn't mean that on every piece of paperwork that I submit to their ballet class and their fourth grade, you know, teacher I'm writing, they are on the spectrum or they have ADHD. Yes. Like you don't, it doesn't need to be, you know, marketed or not marketed what's the word it doesn't need to broadcast it doesn't need to be broadcast everywhere unless it helps you unless it serves you and that's the thing i think with diagnoses is you don't have to tell anyone unless you think it will help you mm -hmm. and it might help them understand why your desk is a mess or you need um a lot of deadlines to help you get stuff done because that's how your adhd needs to mm -hmm. feel you know to be supported or whatever but i i think it's sort of like and also like, honestly, you could get an opinion from one psych and they would diagnose you with depression, right? Right. Or anxiety. You come see me and I'm like, dude, this is a trauma response. Right. You're not going to have this forever. This is just while we're processing it. Yep. And that's the thing I think that kills me is the foreverness, the permanence yes. of it, that people think when I was 16, I was diagnosed with bipolar, borderline personality disorder, whatever. And then they're 40 living with this, you know, um, stigma and feeling mm. embarrassed or feeling ashamed over, you know, a label they were given when they were 20. And it's like, man, but all of that just makes so much sense. It's not something to feel embarrassed about. And I also don't think you should have been diagnosed as bipolar when you were 20, like all the stuff you were going through, it makes so much sense why you were responding that way. And mm. Mm. yeah. So the permanence I think is maybe the point that it's, and that's the thing. Nothing is permanent, right? You can change everything, right? right. You can learn, you can therapy, you can manage, you can put lots of things in place that help medication. You can do lots of different things that help support you with whatever is going on. But mm -hmm. I think the bottom line of what we're saying is it doesn't make you deficient. It doesn't make you broken. It doesn't make you bad. If you have, you know, a diagnosis or something, it's all figure outable, you know? Mm, yeah. 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 For sure. I think the, the, the point that you made about whether it's serving you or not is the most important question to ask because you could talk about religion in that sense, dogmatism, permanence, authoritarianism. We don't want any of that when you're trying to understand your spiritual self, you know? So if you go to a, a, a therapist and they say you might have ADHD, it's like, Oh, this person telling me that Jesus Christ was a cool dude. Like, Oh, have a play and dance with Christianity and I might play and dance with Hinduism. You know, maybe it was depression. Maybe it was a trauma response. 
you know, maybe, maybe ADHD and Ritalin is really what I need right now because I just can't function. I'm just early on the path, you know, because I don't think you and I would, would um, say for a second that we'd pr prefer to have people hurting themselves as opposed to being on medication. That's not what we're saying mm. here, but mm. your, your point, which I think trumps all is, um, is it serving you? You know, what, what's the lifestyle that you want to be living and, and is it working for that or, or against that? Totally. Mm. Is it supporting me? Does this, is this aligned with my values? Is this, mm. you know, bringing me closer to where I want to be? Or is this making me feel horrible about myself? Like at the end of the day, dude, everything is just like a story. Mm. Everything is just a story we tell ourselves. And it's like, what do I want to believe? What do I want to subscribe to? What do I not want to subscribe to? Okay. Well that, that story makes me sleep better at night. Bad. I'm going to tell cool. myself that. <laughs> and it's like, you want to call that delusional. All right. But to me, you're not delusional. If you know that this is, this is just what I'm choosing to subscribe to, mm. you know, I choose like, for example, if I am driving and someone cuts me off, I choose to sub subscribe to the story that they are in an emergency situation and they had to get ahead because they have, you know, someone's dying in the hospital and they need to get there. I don't think they cut me off because they're disrespectful and don't value me. Yeah. Why not? Because that doesn't serve me. That makes me feel like shit. But if I think, oh, they're having a hard day, they need to be somewhere. I'll let them through. That <laughs> makes me feel better. Right. Yes. So it's like, I just apply that same thing with, in this context with the DSM, that it's like, if me finding out I have ADHD makes me feel better about myself, that helps my self-esteem. Cause I realize, oh, it's just the wiring of my brain. I'm actually not lazy and disorganized. It's just how my brain is wired. That serves me. Whereas if ADHD makes me feel embarrassed and bad and dumb and like a loser or a failure, well, then it doesn't serve me. So it's like, you just got to go with what serves you. Yeah, that's so true. Um, Heidi, talk to us about your course with parents, because this has been a very um, important, you know, it's kind of led there quite nicely. Oh, thanks, dude. Um, yeah, so the course that I have is basically a foundational way to understand I don't know, maybe we could call it like parent school, but it's, mm. it's the manual that a lot of parents joke, like kids don't come with the manual. And I'm like, yes, they do. And I yeah. have it right here. It uh, is a way to kind of learn the foundational stuff that most of us didn't learn because, you know, like parenting research wasn't really started until the sixties. And then by the time stuff got sort of synthesized from the research and then written into books and then into pop culture, it's like the eighties and nineties. And a lot of our parenting research came out in like the early two thousands. Mm. So really the people who are parents now raising like primary school kids are kind of the first generation that have access to a lot of this knowledge of what works and what doesn't work, what's helpful, what's not helpful. And so I've basically taken my almost 20 year career in mental health. And then my own experience as a parent myself and mushed it all together into this program which supports you because it, I don't know, teaches you what you don't know and you don't know what you don't know, which is yeah. hard with parenting. Um, and then also, obviously, since I have a trauma lens, it helps kind of make sense of your stuff as a parent, your trauma, your baggage, your childhood stuff, and then sort of alchemizing that to then kind of show up for your kids in the best way you want to be. And then it gives you the sort of practical support of like we have weekly Q and a calls where you can ask your questions and we can workshop it and stuff. And having that kind of weekly support, I think helps people too mm. with parenting because it's so incessant and it's yeah. just never ending. <laughs> and I think it's hard because it's confronting a lot of times because, you know, kids, children are our greatest mirrors, you know, they're our greatest teachers. And so when you have this little person who you really love, but who really triggers you, it's really hard to kind of make sense of what of this is my crop that I'm projecting onto you, or what are you triggering in me that has nothing to do with you and everything to do with me? And how do I make sense of that? Like, that's a big part of the work too, is kind of diving deeper on my stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. And then I think too, just helping families suffer less, I would say is a huge sort of yeah. value of mine is helping which kind of meeting parents and being like, dude, it doesn't need to be this hard. You're making it so much harder for yourself than it needs to be. It doesn't need to be this hard. And I think right now I'm really focusing a lot on the neurodiverse community and working a lot more with kids who, uh, and families whose kids like nothing seems to work on and all of the, the normal parenting books don't apply and they don't seem to help. And 
the strategies that everyone else uses works for them, but it doesn't work for this kid. Mm -hmm. And I call those kids spicy kids. And so spicy kids are sort of something I'm really getting into a lot now with um, a lot of families because they're really, I have a spicy kid myself and they're really hard to parent. And a lot of parents think it's them and that they're doing something wrong. And what it often is, is that you just got to tweak and you got to adjust and you got to mm. parent them differently. And so that's a thing I'm really um, proud about is and excited about is working with families with those kids that are like that nothing works with them. Yes. The kids who've been labeled, dude, it's the kids who've been labeled. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. ODD, ADHD, ASD, um, any of the just tricky kids, yep. challenging kids. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm here to help those parents. Um, mm. yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I thought, I mean, that's a good point. Like, um, I know the attachment theory stuff was done in the sixties, Harry mm-hmm. Harlow and all that kind of thing. And then only now it's kind of really big. Like you see it on Instagram and stuff and everyone's what's your attachment style and all that kind of, you know, another label again, but it's good that it's being discussed, I suppose, but yeah, 60 years beyond. So I think that is an important point. It's a, it takes so long for research to be quashed into, you know, education. Um, so that's um yeah that's really interesting. Well, Heidi, yeah, and always, you look at like yeah. oh sorry, I was just gonna say one more thing. Bessel van der Kolk, another guru in trauma land. Bruce Perry, another guru in trauma land. They and and all of their kind of colleagues have been working for decades to get more stuff into the DSM or that is trauma informed is the wrong mm-hmm. phrase, but like just more aware of trauma stuff. You know, like developmental trauma childhood trauma, like they're trying to get so many more things put into the DSM. So people aren't necessarily labeled as you have blank, but more you had developmental trauma, you had childhood trauma. And that is then what has made you have this drug addiction issue or this, um, disassociation or whatever thing, however it's manifesting. And that, like, if you hear Bessel, oh my Lord, if you hear Bessel or Bruce talk about the DSM, like they do not hold back in their hatred of it. And it, those are one of those things too, where I'm like, man, like there are so many, I would be more of a fan. I think of the DSM, if it included more of that stuff that yep. needs to be in there, you know, anyway, yeah. that's, yeah. I'll, I'll be quiet now. That was my last thing. <laughs> that's all right. that's all good. No, <laughs> it's all worthy. It's all worthy. <laughs> now look, Heidi, it is always so great to, to catch up. Um, and I think, yeah, the more we can get, you know, what, even just from a personal perspective, the more we can catch up, the better. And I was about to talk about with the community, but you know what? You guys can go fuck yourself for all I care. <laughs> I love you all. I love you all. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for having me, dude. It's always fun to chat with you. And yeah, even if it is a bit of an echo chamber, it is always nice to uh, unpack these things and I think help bring insight to other people that maybe they don't have a Tom or a Heidi in their life. And so to have us nerding out over trauma and, you know, polyvagal theory and that kind of mm. thing, I think is helpful for some people to go, Oh, so that's like a a conversation about the DSM. I've always been curious about that, you know? So yeah, I think, I think, I hope that this is helpful. I'm curious to see the feedback of what people say, but I think it will be helpful in, I think the biggest thing is to give yourself, like if I do a summary kind of thought, it's give yourself permission to get a diagnosis, but you don't necessarily need to do anything with it. It just is a piece of information that you can sort of file away, but you don't, it doesn't necessarily need to inform a lot again, if it serves you. Mm, Yeah, that's cool. It could be like the beginning of your journey as opposed to the ending of it. There's someone else wrote for you anyway. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You're the author of your story. You know, nobody else, no dude from 1952 (laughs) writing a book is going to be the guy who's going to tell you who you are and yeah. how you get better. Like only, you know, that, you know, mm, mm. that's a great way to, to finish off. Heidi, thanks so much again, guys. Uh, we'll speak to you next week. Bye.